This is another eye raw podcast. Yeah, I mean, you know, so the subtitle of our book is How Americans Came to Feel the Way They Do About Animals. And what we mean by that is, I mean, it, it's true that it's, it's, it is broadly a story of progress, but it, but in, but more, I think what we mean is that uh, our contention in the book is that these three decades are where you really see the emergence of the kind of contradictory complex of yeah. attitudes that we have about animals, where dogs and cats increasingly become members of the family, which is something you see, at least with dogs in the time period that we write about. You see the emergence of an awareness and a concern kind of at a distance for, for at least certain wildlife species um, with the rise of the conservation movement during this time period. But you really see the the rise of this kind of shadow realm of animal use as symbolized in our book by the rise of the industrial meat industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Animal Tone podcast. I'm so sorry for sounding so stuffy. I know that this doesn't sound good in your ear, so I will keep the intro short. I promise you that during the interview itself, I was right as rain. Today we have a bonus episode where I'm speaking to the authors of Our Kindred Creatures, How Americans Came to Feel the Way They Do About Animals. We start off the conversation talking about moral revolution, but in the end we end up speaking about a whole range of kind of revolutions or changes in ideas that related to animals towards the late 19th, early 20th century, and how uh, there were scientific revolutions, health revolutions, revolutions with regards to animal welfare. And uh, we end up having a pretty interesting conversation, I think, about some of the tensions that come up uh, when thinking across time and across our relationships with various animals. Let me tell you a bit about the authors. Bill Wasik is the editor of the New York Times Magazine, and Monica Murphy is a veterinarian and writer. Their previous book, Rabid, A Cultural History of the World's Most Diabolical Virus, was a Los Angeles Best Time seller, as well as a finalist for the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. They live in Brooklyn, New York. While I have you here, uh, just a couple of announcements. One, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Animal Highlight, which is our sister podcast and features content that directly and explicitly focuses on animals instead of the concept as we do here, head over to the Animal Highlight and make sure you subscribe. If you've got a spot of time to rate and review the Animal Turn, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. If you voted in the Women in Podcasting Awards, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the results are still pending, but I know uh, many of you contacted me and said that you voted. I appreciate your time and the effort and the energy that went into doing that. And finally, uh, another kind of announcement that's quite exciting is the Animal Turn now has a merch store. If you head over to our website, you'll see a neat little tab that's called Merch with amazing designs that have been done by Rebecca Shen, as well as content featuring our awesome logo that was designed by Jeremy John. Uh, the profits or the proceeds will go towards supporting the podcast and the variety of creatives and folks that are helping to make the podcast better and better and better. Uh, and there is some content there that goes directly towards sanctuaries uh, or nonprofits that are working towards making the world a better place for animals. So head over to the merch. Uh, let us know if you happen to buy something. Make sure you tag us on social media. It would be wonderful to see that out in the world. So thank you, everybody, for uh, your support of the show. And thank you, as always, to Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law, and Ethics for being a longtime supporter and sponsor of the show. Uh, I so value my connection with you guys. Okay, enough of all of the thank yous. Uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. It was a really fascinating and interesting discussion. Uh, I always enjoy talking to people who look at history. Uh, so enjoy. Hi, Bill and Monica. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Animal Tone Podcast. Hi there. Hi. I very much enjoyed reading your book. When I picked up Our Kindred Creatures, I wasn't too sure which direction it was going to go, uh, what kind of history you were planning on doing. And uh, I learned a great deal, I think, about animal activism and its history in the United States. So thank you so much for your work on this book and for joining me on the show today. Now, uh, when I have guests on the show, I tend to want to center the conversation around a concept of sorts. And having you know read your book and thought a bit about it before today, I was really thinking that moral revolution seems to be at the center of your your book. That that that's kind of or awakening, moral revolution or awakening seems to be at the center of your book. 
And uh, that made me think a bit about your motivations for doing the book. Why, why did you want to write Our Kindred Creatures to begin with? Well, we had written a previous book about the history of rabies. Um, so Monica, we're married. Monica's a veterinarian. Um, I'm a writer, a magazine editor. Um, and we were interested in the subject of rabies. And there were sort of breadcrumbs of history kind of going back 4,000 years. Um, and I think that you know, we really enjoyed the process of writing together. We, we loved how it turned out. And when we were thinking about what we wanted to do for a follow-up book, we wanted to really focus on one time period. And I think the late 19th century really stood out for us mm -hmm. as, as just, just a fascinating moment, so much rich primary source material to go through. And also a, just a moment, just an incredible hinge point in the history of animals. Um, and so we, we tried on various ideas for exactly how we would do the book um, before arriving at this idea that we would focus just on America and we would focus on the three decades after the Civil War mm. when you have not just the rise of the animal welfare movement, but all of these incredible other shifts, um, the, the rise of the early rise of the conservation movement of veterinary medicine, um, the beginnings of medical research on animals, as well as the movement against medical research on animals, um, zoos and circuses, uh, and then the the rise of the industrial meat industry really, I think, is a harbinger so much of the kind of animal order that we that we have today. Yeah, it's it's incredible that that time period. And so I have spent some time in the archives looking at historical documents, and I know that putting together a book like this takes an immense amount of time, and it's a lot of fun going through that kind of archival material. So you said such great source material. Did you know? Because throughout the book, I mean, while there are animals throughout the book, you talk about turtles, you talk about horses, you talk about a whole range of different animals. It's really a story about the activists, the people who were changing the narrative in many ways in the United States. Did you know that going into the archives? Were you like, oh, these are people whose stories we need to find? Or did they kind of just emerge? Like, how, how, did, you, how did you broach this? I think both is true. We we did um, start knowing something about some of the important players in this time period who affected the way people saw animals. But as we dug in, of course, we there was ongoing discovery of of more stories, more people, more moments um, that seemed important or interesting or hilarious or sad. Um, and so, as you say, going through archival material is is really, really rewarding and and fascinating. Um, so I, I think this book became what it was uh, largely because of the stuff we dug up in our initial explorations. I, I would also just add, I think we think about the activists as, in a sense, the protagonists of the story in the kind of classical sense of the actors who sort of set the story in motion in certain ways. But in other ways, I mean, we're, we're very interested, not just in the animals that were affected and we try to kind of profile some of them throughout the book, but we're also very interested in, in the other people who were caught up in, in the kind of the, not just the, the the moral shift prompted by the activism, but also all of the economic and cultural shifts that were that were involved in changing how animals were thought of and how they were being used. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's it is ultimately the activists are the kind of through line of the book. But we, in some ways, I think are as interested, if not in some places, more interested in the people who are kind of on the other side of or 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 in alliance with or you know, part of the story in a different way. Mm, yeah, I think, I mean, that really came up with the tensions between, was it Henry Berg and P.T. Barnum, who I think to, to many folks might know their names already, you know, P.T. Barnum being really well known for his menageries and eventually setting up of circuses. Um, and yeah, you had just incredible details there about that fire and, you know, aquariums and tanks exploding, Well, which, which I'd love if you could give the listeners some details on that, that would be wonderful. But kind of the tension between Barnum and Henry Berg, who's this character that most people know because of his his uh, heritage with the ASPCA, um, 
they were, I, I've never heard of these stories kind of in, in tandem with one another. People tend to talk about Barnum in one area when they're talking about menageries, and they tend to talk about Henry Berg when they're talking about activists. But you don't really realize that they, they had a shared history in many ways. Yeah, we, we like to call them frenemies. Um, the, they, they played a, a important foils to one another, I think, um, in the way they interacted and engaged a, around animal welfare. Mm. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about about that story with regards to um, the it was whales, right? That were being kept in in the aquarium, um, and just the I mean the, the scale. It gives a sense of just the distances that animals were moving to kind of feed this curiosity that people had. Yeah. So so P. T. Barnum was famous in New York City uh, for years before Henry Berg sort of brought his animal welfare movement to the United States in New York. Um, and his museum, which he established in lower Manhattan, was really just a very important, famous place. Visitors from out of town to New York City would, would characterize it as a must-see. Um, locals made a, a habit of taking their children there. And amongst the attractions sort of nestled between the like real and fake historical artifacts and taxidermy um, were live animal displays. He really uh, highlighted these in his advertisements to, to bring people into the museum. And people responded. They were, they were very curious about animals from other places in the world um, that, that looked different from the animals they were used to seeing. And so it was a real sort of peak entertainment uh, that P.T. Barnum conceived when he decided to bring a pair of beluga whales down from Labrador to uh, put on display in New York City. He became uh, personally involved in the live capture of a pair of beluga whales and then transport by rail in special wooden crates where they were kept moist. Um, he had publicity stops in multiple towns on, on the way down so that, you know, there was sort of a rolling advertisement for the attraction in New York City. And then once the whales were here in a sort of makeshift, dirty basement tank, uh, he promoted them widely, better come see them quick because they're not likely to survive for very long. It was it was very popular. And, and so those first two beluga whales became a succession of beluga whales who who many of whom died in transit or died shortly after arrival in New York. He did, to his <laughs> partial credit, uh, improve the, the facility in which he kept them. P.T. Barnum was, for reasons economic, but pro probably went beyond that. He was very motivated to try to provide the best possible care for the animals in whom he had invested. Um, he wanted to keep them around. He wanted to keep the visitors coming. So he figured some things out about the conditions in which beluga whales might survive for a bit longer in his New York museum. But ultimately, his American museum, its its first iteration, succumbed to fire in just a, a year or so before uh, Henry Berg would start the animal welfare movement in the United States. The beluga whales were among the casualties. They, the firefighters actually tried to use the water from the tank to uh, to, to subdue the fire. Um, but ultimately, the whole museum burned to the ground. And although Barnum wasn't Barnum's career wasn't done by any means, he would bring more more animals to New York over the years. That was the end of beluga whale displays in New York. Yeah, it's a, it's a devastating story, and you really you captured, I think, the drama of it. I could only imagine being in a city at that time watching this massive, and you, you spoke about the sounds emanating from the museum, right? Like the number of animals that were shrieking and screaming, and you've got, um, of course, horses bringing water, trying to put this out. I, I, you could only imagine the spectacle, and in between all of this, you've got whales, some of the first whales ever kept in captivity. I mean, you really captured my my imagination with 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 that chapter. But coming back to this idea of moral revolution, because in some ways I think you know maybe we're seeing a revolution of sorts taking place with whales. You know, Canada is now starting to phase that out. You're you're starting to see more and more aquariums recognizing that whales uh, at least should not be kept in in captivity in these situations. And this is perhaps a kind of extension of what was begun 
you know, in the late 19th century. But it's not often, I think, people will speak about animal rights as a revolution. It's a uh, it's it's an interesting take. What made you kind of frame it in that way of thinking about this as a moral revolution at this time? Yeah, I, we, you know, we came to this story, um, I think, not sure how much we wanted to credit this generation of animal activists with a moral revolution. You know, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, in, in animal liberation, Peter Singer um, is pretty down on. Uh, the animal activists of this era and and very focused on how they were sort of too cozy with power, how they kind of stopped short of getting anything real done or of really advocating for all the animals and not just some animals, et cetera. Um, I think we were unprepared or one of the things that I think we realized as we got into it was, you know, they they really came into a situation where animals were thought of as property and it just simply was not thinking your way into the animal's perspective in any way just simply wasn't done at the time um you know we tell the story of black beauty you know which is written in the 1870s in england um but really only becomes a a, a global sensation when in 1890 george angel in the united states who's, who's one of the main other than berg sort of one of the main animal activists here um he just starts pirating it and prints tens of thousands of copies. And eventually it becomes one of the best selling books of the century. And the fact that the book was narrated by a horse, that it was a whole novel where the writer had taken the trouble of, of, of imagining a horse's perspective, which today of course feels so old hat to us. And it's, it's like the stuff of countless children's books um, is, was, was very profound and plenty of adult readers and critics talked about how affecting it was to have you know, the perspective of a horse kind of narrated from in that in that way. And I do think that a lot of the insofar as there was a kind of moral revolution, I do think that that sort of initial initial move of human beings sort of realizing that animals had to suffer, you know, even if they their brains didn't work exactly the way that ours did, that that the suffering that they felt and could not speak of had to be something that was worth taking into consideration and that that was a very powerful realization and that it led to a lot of positive change. And it really did, um, it really did affect how they were treated. No, and I, I really appreciate what you said there about kind of moving the needle a bit because Peter Singer is, he's kind of, he's kind of, it's almost without thoughts. A lot of us will speak about the animal rights movements and Peter Singer will kind of be this odd beginning point. And maybe it's because for a lot of people that was, you know, reading his work was for them, their awakening or their realization, a kind of modern realization. Um, but you realize that we had to have fertile ground for Peter Singer to think the thoughts he was thinking as well. And and at this time in the late 19th century, as you, I mean, animals are still overtly thought of as property today, or they are still property. And I think maybe there's some, you know, conflict, especially when we think about pets, you know, pets are property. And now slowly laws are starting to change that are thinking about how we can Think through pets as being, you know, members of the family, for example. Um, but at that time, as you say, kind of the idea that any sort of model moral consideration should be given to animals was brand new. You just did stuff with animals. It, it wasn't, you know, horses needed to take things. Things needed to get done. The streets were full of trash and rubbish, and horses would slip. There would be accidents. It just was the way it was. Um, and I think perhaps then, as now, people maybe thought. If you were interested in animals or animals' welfare, that was maybe the position of the privileged. You know, uh, you you had to be in a privileged position to to care about animals. Uh, would you Would you agree with that, or am I just putting a whole bunch of different ideas in there that that don't fit? Well, certainly, it was the case that the animal activists of this generation and and all of the humanitarian movements, the leaders of all the humanitarian movements, tended to come from privilege. And a lot of the workers who had direct engagement with animals, whether they're working in a slaughter facility or they're driving a horse or a team of horses, um, they these these people came from from a different class than those who led the animal welfare movements. And so um, the sort of zeal for prosecuting people who, uh, for example, you know, were would beat a horse because the horse wasn't performing 
work uh, fast enough or hard enough, that did set up a, a situation in which, you know, a, a common critique of the movement was you, you, here you are prosecuting a man who will now languish in jail for beating the horse and his children won't get to eat. Um, and, and all this, you know, for, for this animal. Um, so as you say, then is now privilege was, was definitely an, an accusation against the, the sort of movement itself. But, you know, I, I think I sort of coming back to this point about moral revolutions, I mean, I, I think that, that one of the things about coming to history and trying to, to, to kind of understand where people begin their own journeys and, and the history that led up to that and the possibilities that, that seem to exist as a way of understanding why they they got to where they did and and no further i think is is useful you know i mean one thing that that we often that often comes up a source of surprise sometimes when we talk to people who come from an animal rights you know place is the fact that none of the leaders um of of the movement in the 19th century were vegetarians, even though their vegetarianism did exist at the time mm -hmm. and was sort of seen through the lens of certain health ideas, some of some of which were right and, some, and many of which were wrong. Um, so there was a vegetarian movement, but the but 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 the animal welfare movement, as far as we could tell, didn't really seem to intersect with it. And, and mm -hmm. none of the figures who we thought about were vegetarians, which which I, I think is 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 symptomatic of of a broader point that the idea that 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 in a world where where animals were really seen as almost as as objects or machines to sort of be used as anybody saw fit without very much care the animal welfare activists wanted to to sort of use them more humanely the idea mm. of a world where we didn't use them um was not one that they, that, that I think was. I mean, it, the economy depended that, utterly exactly, exactly on animals. Right. Like you know, they, they, to, to put an end to use of, of horses would be to just stop, you know, the. Yeah, that's exactly, no, that's exactly right. And that, and that, and that if we're able, if we are able to imagine a world where we don't use animals today, it is in part because uh, we, we have, we can't imagine a world in which in which they're not being used. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? No, it does. It makes it makes sense. And um, it's actually it's interesting. I had Sean Wensley on the show not too long ago, um, talking about animal welfare and veterinary veterinary ethics and practice. And and towards the end of the episode, we spoke about animal use and kind of how the history of veterinary practice is quite entangled with animal use. You know, the the emergence of vets was attached in many ways to horses and their use and their their you know their abundance in cities uh, and then when horse use declined in cities um vets shifted and changed and the profession kind of shifted and changed um and and i hear what you're saying that these people the way they practice might not be the same as how we think about animal rights today i think a lot of people when they talk about animal rights today they'll equate it with things like veganism and vegetarianism but historically there were different battles being fought food wasn't even necessarily something on on the agenda um and you know i but i, I wonder though so you say you know you think we have space now to imagine a world without animal use now because of the works of some of these people but I, I think for most folks, they, they struggle with making that separation. Most animals are still equated with use, even though we accept and appreciate that they're not objects. So historically, animals were just objects that we can use. And I think now there's maybe some cognitive dissonance where animals are not objects. We love them and they're amazing, but we can use them, um, which is a different kind of time, um, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, so the subtitle of our book is How Americans Came to Feel the Way They Do About Animals. Mm. Um and what we mean by that is, I mean, it it's true that it's it's it is broadly a story of progress. Um but it 
but in, but more, I think what we mean is that uh, our contention in the book is that these three decades are where you really see the emergence of the kind of contradictory complex of yeah. attitudes that we have about animals, where dogs and cats increasingly become members of the family, which is something you see, at least with dogs in the time period that we write about. Um, you see the emergence of an awareness and a concern kind of at a distance for, for at least certain wildlife species um, with the rise of the conservation movement during this time period. Um, but you really see the the rise of this kind of shadow realm of animal use um, as symbolized in our book by the rise of the industrial meat industry. But there are mm -hmm. certain other certainly other realms of animal use that fall into this category where the the use of them is happening at, at such a distance, you know, a physical distance, a psychological distance um, to the point that we might be enjoying or I mean I mean the vast majority of people uh are consuming animal products without having a single thought about the fact that they come from animals um and that is made possible because it has all been moved so far out of human society and I think that that's a really important shift and and I think if you wanted I think if we were to, to, to give one reason why the progress of this era didn't go further was that it was taking place kind of at the same time as the rise of industrial capitalism, which allowed for a, a different kind of animal economy that really moved the animals being used kind of out of the the, the, the local sphere of concern where we mm. felt implicated in, in how they were being used. That's really interesting. So, I mean, you've got industrialization happening, you've got heightened use and in, in across many, many sectors happening, um, but also what you you have a bit of a cultural revolution happening. You know, you spoke about black beauty, you spoke about, uh, you know, how the imagination of folks is changing towards animals. And this speaks to your, your contradiction. So on the one hand, you've got industrial use and more need and varied need for animals. Uh, Cause it's not just that animals are being, the same animals are being used, the same animals are being used in more various ways. Right. And, and I think what you spoke about in Chicago was quite interesting because you know, William Cronin also wrote about this, that it wasn't just that meat was being packed in the same way. They started to find ways to use the offcuts. And this is really where packers started to make profits and make money was not just the, like a butcher would cut up meat and sell meat fresh. Packers would cut it up. They figured out how to freeze their railways. They moved meat across spaces and they made use of byproducts and byproducts was where the profit sat. So you've kind of got that industrial revolution happening on the one side um, with regards to how animals are used. And on the other side, to add to the contradiction, you've got this cultural uh, and social shift where you've got stories like black beauty happening and you've got changes in the ideas with regards to things like fashion um, so you spoke quite a bit in the book about fashion. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, because I think those often get overlooked when we have these conversations. We talk about meat and we talk about slaughterhouses, uh, and they are, of course, very important. But the changes in fashion greatly changed, I think, the ways in which people thought about animals at this time as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Well, I think the best example is the use of bird and bird parts and products on ladies' hats. Um, which was very popular in the 19th century. I think it had sort of waves of, of popularity. Um, at one point, the, the wings of, of certain seabirds sort of made a jaunty ornament on one side of the hat and whole taxidermied hummingbirds or heads of owls might be situated on the crown of the hat. But lots and lots of feathers, big ostrich plumes, but also the the sort of very rare, delicate uh, feathers that come from the breeding egret and heron were considered very desirable ornaments for women's hats, uh, such that if you walked through the park, which uh, one ornithologist famously did during the 19th century, you could, in a afternoon see hundreds of species of native birds displayed or maybe it was dozens or, yeah, or scores of species yeah. it was many species of of native birds displayed on women's hats so you could go on a real bird walk uh, just just seeing just seeing ladies hats this um this issue of of the sort of waste of of bird life to to ornament uh 
you know, to provide ornaments for women was taken up as an important cause driving the early conservation movement in this country. Um, ornithologists organized around this issue, establishing the Audubon Society, which really was established sort of twice, um, but it's, its primary sort of animating issue was trying to persuade women to use something other than birds and bird parts on their hats. And, and they actually, you know, did have some successes, but, but moreover, they sort of got groups established that then could broaden the causes and do more in conservation. And, and of course, we still have uh, the descendants of those societies today. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of those societies is the, 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 Auburn, the Auburn Society. And, and while reading your book, I was thinking, in many ways, you're speaking about these individuals, you know, like, um, I always thought his name was Angle, but you said it's an Angel um, and, and Berg. Uh, but you've also got the formation of many societies. You've got the Humane Society, the ASPCA, I think you said the, the Auburn Society. There's a whole bunch of societies. So it seems to also be a time where there's an institutionalization of the movements. It's no longer just individuals trying to do things. It's it's them trying to institutionalize. And um, one thing that's interesting about this institutionalization is that it seemed to be very much centered on women. While there are some big characters like Berg and and Angel, angel um, whose names come up repeatedly in the histories, there are a lot of women who are forming these societies and leading these campaigns. Yeah, this is a subject on which there was a big cultural shift even during the time period that we write about. Um, so for example, uh, Carolyn Earl White um, is, is one of the big animal activist figures um, during this period. And she essentially starts up a uh, uh, is is the the prime mover in the creation of the Pennsylvania SPCA, which is one of the big three that that begin sort of at the very beginning of the movement. Um, but at that time in the 1860s, it was not socially acceptable, f- even in these progressive circles, for women to be leaders of movements and organizations. It wasn't seen as proper, and so she had to stand aside for male leadership. Um, by the end of the time period, we write about she founds the American Anti Vivisection Society and and really is is I mean at various points they have male presidents but um but that kind of falls away past a certain point she really is very clearly the leader of that group and it's just generally seen as more socially acceptable even by the 1880s and 1890s for women to be in leadership roles and in fact you really have this explosion in those decades uh, of women's women's groups you know there even was you know we, we write about how there's a con you know a conference of of women's groups and there's hundreds there's hundreds of them and this really takes off um in the united states in the in the 1880s and 1890s well and beyond the leadership the women were i think very much the, the sort of foot soldiers of these uh movements and and that goes back to before that's true. what we're writing about in the anti-slavery movement um, women were very deeply involved in that effort, um, even if their names weren't at the top of the organization. They were writing letters, and they were, um, you know, t- sort of, t- sort of talking to their neighbors and their churches, and providing sort of information campaigns. Um, and they, uh, I, I think, really can be credited with a lot of of shifts in public opinion, the hearts and minds part mm-hmm. of of these movements. Um, and that's yeah. true. I really yeah. appreciated how much voice you gave to, to um, it's a weird sentence. I appreciated how present women were in, in your book. You know, it is kind of a, I think, a common narrative that women and the animal rights movements and the animal welfare movement, there is a kind of connection. And sometimes it's used um, negatively or historically it has been used to kind of dissuade this as just being an emotional, not serious movement. Um, so there was, you know, it was the moralizing was a negative thing. Somehow women being involved was a negative thing. And now that it's gained some traction, even we brought up Peter Singer. I know some critique has been thrown there as well, saying he's become this kind of figurehead for the movement where his ideas are also precedented on a lot of um, people, indigenous knowledges and and also um, women's knowledge that came before that. Of course, he's done he's done a great deal for, for changing people's minds. It's just, it's interesting who's... Um, whose voices and whose ideas get included in histories like these and whose who's are excluded. A key thing you mention in your book is that one of the reasons that this time was 
fertile for thinking about animals and the ways animals experience the world and suffer or have the potential to suffer was because this time period now is following the end of the civil war. And this is an important factor for shaping animal welfare or discourse about animal welfare. Why, why is that? Did you see the Colombian government is spending almost $4 million to relocate Pablo Escobar's hippos? In Brazil, a school of piranha attacked and injured at least eight people at a beach resort. First fatal mountain lion attack in 20 years in California. Hey, it's me, Forrest Galante, wildlife biologist. You may have seen me on Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive or Shark Week. So join me and my friends as we break down animal news from around the world and discuss all things wildlife. Click here to unlock these animal mysteries. Well, I mean, I, I think you can you can kind of look at it two different ways. You know, one of one of it is that you know this is a movement that begins in the 1820s and 1830s in, in I mean, it begins the 1820s in England and then spreads throughout Europe. And I think that partly why it takes until after the Civil War to spread to the United States is that, of course, the sort of progressive humanitarian. Um, figures of of in America during that time period were just 100% focused on fighting slavery, this kind of monstrous, uh, you know, very, you know, very uh, shameful American institution that um, the rest of the world, for the most part, had, had turned against already. Um, and so, you know, after the end of the Civil War, I think it kind of unlocked the energies of these people um, to to focus their attentions on on other kind of festering social problems. So some of it flows into um, women's suffrage. Some of it flows into um, temperance. Interestingly, I mean, we, we sometimes think of as a kind of reactionary movement, but really was associated with a lot of the same figures who supported other more progressive social movements during this time period. Um, the sense that alcohol was was you know causing men to beat their wives and mm -hmm. and um leading to the dissolution of families um and that that people were making money from and beat their horses yeah and beat their horses too <laughs> yeah many many people in the animal welfare movement were temperance activists as well um and there was that class dynamic to it which was again slightly shameful but also somewhat correct you know that 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 drink really was leading to a lot of social problems during this period. So, at any rate, you know, the, and, but but one of the causes that really benefits from this, and that and it's the reason why I think it it it, it starts up and spreads so quickly after 1866, is that it's you know the 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 people who who craved the end of slavery, whether they were fighting in the war, whether they had been really active as abolitionists, the sense that now that this sort of national shame had ended, that um, these other causes could, you know, were, were, had their, their time now, um, I think was, was very much in the air. Yeah, it was a revolutionary time, um, I guess. And I, I really appreciate, again, those, those decades that you focused on. And it comes up for many reasons. You know, it's also a big urban change. You've got a lot of urban changes happening. The city is changing in pretty dramatic ways, and that's partly associated with what we were talking about with the kind of increasing industrial production of things, you know, a variety of things. These cultural shifts and changes happening where women are taking more and more uh, roles in various institutions. Uh, there's more and more appreciation that the actions we take as individuals and as societies matter. They matter in terms of how we treat each other as people, whether it's different women or different races. Uh, but now I think what you're talking about is that it's not only among people that it matters, it also matters amongst uh, humans and animals. But of course, this line between humans and animals hasn't always been as clear as what we maybe think of it as today. Um, and one of the the blurry stories that kind of shows this is your case about children and how children's rights was very much in America was very much attached and associated with animal rights. Could you walk us through that a little bit and what happened there? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I the way I sort of think about it is that is that as people were awaking to the the needs of kind of um just the, the the depth of social problems 
that the government's um, I don't think this was just true in the United States. We, the, 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 the strong modern state, what we think of as, you know, hey, these are problems that governments solve that just simply didn't exist in the same way during this time period. And so um, one of the, I think, historical oddities of this era is that a movement for the protection of animals started up uh, right after the Civil War before there was really any organized effort to protect children against against cruelty. And so um, another another thing that I think readers are surprised by of our book is that, you know, the model that the ASPCA established, um, the ASPCA, despite being called the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, actually only had jurisdiction in New York. And they were empowered by a New York state law to prosecute themselves, cases, cases of cruelty to animals. So, you know, the moment that Henry Berg gets this law passed, he, he literally starts going out in the streets. He has agents who go out in the streets, they see cases of cruelty, and they directly arrest these people and take them in front of a judge. So this is a mm -hmm. private organization that's been empowered with uh, to, to do its own law enforcement. And, and so for years, people would go to Henry Berg and say, you know, hey, would you, there's this case in my neighborhood of somebody who's mistreating a child, brutally mistreating a child. And he would say, well, that's not my, essentially, that's not my jurisdiction. But then eventually he decides to act. And so um, I believe it was 150 years ago this year um, was the, the famous first case of child of cruelty to children prosecuted in the United States. It was a little girl named Mary Ellen. And um, Berg hears about this kind of really, really rough case of, of um, you know, she was essentially being beaten and essentially imprisoned in, in this home. And he sends two of the agents to go and, um, and, and liberate her and arrest the, the adoptive parents and, and succeeds uh, in court in prosecuting them, not on the basis of the, the cruelty to animal statute, um, but on habeas yeah habeas corpus, which was very strange grounds, but but so essentially inspired by this, he and some of his allies go to Albany and have a law passed for um, essentially to to for the prosecution of of cruelty to children, and that in turn spreads around the country too. Um, and uh, you know a lot of the organizations that were called humane societies in the United States they took that title because they were actually prosecuting and, and policing both cases of animal cruelty and cruelty to children. Hmm. Um, and that in fact, by the early 1900s, there were more of the organizations were doing both than were just doing animals. Um, you know, and, and that's fascinating. When, yeah. when did they start to split? Like, when did you start to see the, the splitting of these dual functions? Well, I I don't know the exact chronology, but but I think it's only during what we tend to call the progressive era in the early 1900s, sort of beginning with the Teddy Roosevelt administration, that you really see the the, the stronger kind of state that you know government set of functions that we think of today coming into view, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, you start to see police forces becoming more like what we currently think of as police forces, where they are, you know, they're using elaborate detective work and archives to solve crimes that might have been committed weeks ago, right? The, 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 the 19th century model of police forces was if you see somebody doing something in the street, or you grab somebody who just committed a crime and call a police officer and have them come over and take the person, then, then, mm -hmm. then they might get prosecuted, but otherwise there, there was not that sense of policing as something that was, it, it was more what they would call like a constable and watch system. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, as bureaucratic. There wasn't as much. You know, even <laughs> taxation. I mean, at the point that the era we're writing about, um, at least the beginning of the era, there's no income tax. There's no federal income tax. There's no, um, so, so that really starts up. And, and so you start to see things like cruelty to children and cruelty to animals, you begin to see the, 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 the realization that, Hey, these should be, these, these, these should be things that the, that, that the government in some form mm. is doing as opposed to something that we would empower private groups to do. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating. Cause I think when, 
so I did, I did some research on the history of animals in Canada and, you know, some of the first bylaws in Canadian cities were for animals. And I think a lot of people are quite surprised by that because animals were so present. There were hundreds and hundreds of them in cities and they required policing. Uh, and, and as you say, some of that policing was quite rudimentary, but still some of the first resources urban areas had were towards policing the movements of animals and those who owned animals. Uh, and I think many folks are quite surprised that children weren't part of this. Like, I think children just fit into society. They were expected to do things and um, they only became visible, I guess, as ideas of vulnerability started to maybe make an emergence. Like people were awakened, to use your terminology, to the idea that not all humans are the same. Uh, they don't all have the same histories and we have different vulnerabilities at different points in our lives. So it's quite fascinating that entangled history of of children's rights and animal rights, uh, because I think children are often mobilized in interesting ways in discussions about animals. Even today, you'll hear uh, reactions to dogs um, or, or rabies. Yeah, I know you've, you've written about rabies historically. Children are mobilized in pretty interesting ways to work against animals as well, to say, well, the, these dogs killed children, so they have to be, somehow it's even more egregious if the harm is done to a children, a child. Sorry, So that shows a, a marked change in thinking about children in in a relatively short period of time yeah I, I, you know i i definitely believe that this kind of move this move towards the dual model of the humane society um i certainly think got in the way of the animal welfare movement of that time period really fully uh embracing some of the more radical notions that I think were possible uh, uh, at this moment. You know, the, the turtle, we write about the turtle case where at the very beginning of his, of his um, activism, Henry Berg prosecuted the case of, of turtles having been stored, um, you know, upside down with, with their, their flippers pierced with cords and it became a real sensation. He lost the case, and I definitely don't think he lost the battle for public opinion, but it did kind of put on the table the idea that, hey, this isn't just about dogs and horses. This is hypothetically about any animal that's being treated cruelly, that's being asked to suffer. That, I think, didn't go, that uh, kind of awakening on behalf of, of less standard species didn't necessarily go that far. Um in the subsequent years. And I definitely don't think that an organization that is simultaneously sending its agents to investigate cases of child cruelty and animal cruelty was ever going to decide that it was going to be, you know, more aggressive or more radical on this question of which species were, were taken into consideration. Yeah, I think you spoke about slippery slopes and how actually having that dual function meant that people said, oh, you know, when when does their authority end? It started to actually open up a lot of criticism for some of uh, Henry Berg's actions. Uh, and he was being caricatured quite quite heavily because it seemed as though he could do anything, in effect. Even though he, I mean, we make it sound like he was extremely successful. I think a lot of the cases he brought forward weren't successful, but he was a thorn. He was a constant, both him and um, Angel, Angel were kind of constant thorns for a long, long, long time. And there's something about that consistency that's quite remarkable. But in kind of thinking about other animals, uh, Monica, maybe you could talk us through a little bit about scientific changes and veterinary practice changes, because I think this time period here is also, it's not only financial or capital revolution, it's not only a cultural revolution, but it's a scientific revolution happening now with the, the emergence of bacteriology and stuff. How did this change or shift the the moral thinking towards animals. So the this is the, the time period in which veterinarians in the United States are uh, sort of becoming organized and and uh, and becoming educated. Uh, prior to this, pretty much anyone could declare themselves an animal doctor and uh, you know open a storefront and and charge money to to take care of horses or dogs or what have you, but. We see the establishment of veterinary schools uh, where students are taught according to the best science of the day, uh, not necessarily the best science of this day, but what they had at the time uh, to minister to the sufferings of animals and extend their lives. Uh, and so 
we, as those veterinarians are becoming educated, they're becoming organized, they, they establish societies, they uh, also establish medical journals, which is really critical to the improvement of practice uh, in veterinary medicine as well as other, other professions. So the idea that, that scientific studies that were being done in Europe were brought to American veterinary audience through veterinary journals and, and case reports and other sort of interesting discussions about outbreaks and, and new findings were sort of right there for veterinarians to read to inform their practice. All of that is is new to to the the era. Um, and it's it's partly because of the economic importance of horses, as you mentioned earlier, that the veterinarians are able to sort of charge adequately for their services to really sort of think deeply about how how to do it best and spend money on their educations and take time to to get together and and uh, encourage one another to better practice. It's also because of the sort of value placed on on relief of suffering because of the animal welfare movement that veterinarians are you know more frequently called out and and uh, engaged to to try to relieve pain. I mean, even the ASPCA hired veterinarians um, mm -hmm. as consultants and to help prosecute their cases. The science, though, that that underlies veterinary medicine as well as animal or, or as well as human medicine and other health professions does, of course, rely on animal research. And so that is, um, you know, it, it's a it's a tension um, as it is today for for people who care enough about animals to devote their careers to relieving their suffering and pain and and trying to help them be healthier and 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 yet, like, to do a good job at this, you have to, to use science. And, and science, um, especially then, didn't have really any good alternatives to animal testing in order to, to sort of further the understanding of, of how, to, how to take care of animals. And, and the best example of, of the great science that was sort of coming out at the time relying on animals was, was the work of Louis Pasteur in France. His work... For, led to uh, after he did a whole bunch of other important things like uh, proving the germ theory um, and and a, sort of establishing the science for asepsis, he developed the the first modern vaccines, the first two modern vaccines. And by modern, I mean vaccines that relied on the laboratory manipulation of microbes to make them sort of safe enough to induce immunity in vulnerable individuals. Um, as opposed to the sort of Jennerian vaccine, um, Jenner's smallpox vaccine was sort mm -hmm. of more of a happenstance harnessing of a natural virus to induce immunity in, in humans. Pasteur's great leap forward in, in sort of capturing and manipulating microbes to create immunity uh, first found application with, two, with some veterinary vaccines, um, including chicken cholera and anthrax, both really economically important diseases. His his first human vaccine, famously, was the rabies vaccine, and as we we know now, the rabies vaccine was tremendously important. Not not simply because it allowed people to survive bites from rabid animals, but because ultimately it could be used prophylactically in dogs, which would uh, you know prevent the exposure of humans to to rabies but also really transform our relationship with dogs and, mm -hmm. and make them just, uh, you know, much, much more reliable companions who couldn't, you know, be infected with something that would cause them to turn on us and endanger us and our, our family members. So how um, prolific was rabies at this time amongst dogs? Not very, <laughs> not okay. very. It, it, it is um, rabies then and now is a really horrifying illness barely survivable. I mean, we should consider it not survivable. Once once you're sick with rabies, you're almost certainly going to die of rabies. The the course is short but involves great suffering and and really sort of outrageous symptoms that horrified onlookers. And and it affects children more frequently than adults. So it is, you know, a, a really obviously, you know, 
diseases that affect children are are especially horrifying. Right. Mm -hmm. Rabies was was feared far out of proportion to its numbers, but it was so feared that it led to just like huge brutality against stray dogs. So, so, So you would have these like mass culling of dogs when there would be any kind of rabies outbreak. And so, yeah, I mean, this creates so much cognitive dissonance during the period that we're writing about um, because, you know, to create the vaccine, Pasteur had to use, um, I mean, he was using rabbits. uh, Dogs too, but mainly rabbits and a few guinea pigs. And then to actually manufacture the vaccine, he was using rabbits rabbits as well. Um, And so a lot of animals were dying in the creation of of this vaccine. And yet not only was it saving people, but it it effectively over time saves an incredible number of, of animals. Mm-hmm. And so this created just an incredible cognitive dissonance for animal activists. They basically just could not allow themselves to believe that the vaccine was working because it had been created cruelly. Like they had they they had invested very strongly in a mindset in which animal research uh, simply wasn't effective, that that nothing useful could come of it. Um, And so they were very strident about the idea that actually it it was a myth. And in fact, the the vaccine was harmful as opposed to being helpful. And they just simply were were wrong about that. Um, And Mm -hmm. it really, I think, is in some ways the kind of ultimate example of, of of a kind of clash between the the animal welfare activists of this era and this kind of rising more scientific uh attitude about sort of you know improving medicine by any means necessary for the greater good e- even if that means um these these re- sacrifice of animals re- sacrifice of animals that i think we definitely still see in some forms to this day you know mm-hmm. and there's there's a lot of talk about replacing animal models and research. And I think that it is definitely possible, but it would be an incredibly radical shift to, to end animal research. Um, and, and, uh, and that's, I think, you know, you, you see kind of in this era, in the, in the debates that we write about, I think you see sort of in infancy, uh, some of the same, some of the same issues that we continue to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think throughout the book, several of the fights and challenges that emerged, and there's there's something both reassuring and challenging about it, because as much as things have changed, they've stayed the same in many ways, right? Even even the debates over specs, like animals in, in zoos and the extent to how, how can we really justify putting animals in zoos for, you know, educational purposes or scientific purposes, the extent to which those discourses have really changed substantially, I mean, in the real, the real gut of the discourse is pretty much still the same. It's still centered on kind of making money in some way or form, um, and using animals to create education, science. And you, so you are having some of these benefits coming from, let's say, keeping animals in zoos. But whether those benefits can be measured or weighed against the harms done to those individuals is a big challenge. Of course, many. Um, people like me would say, no, it's not worth it. How do we justify doing that? Uh, but I appreciate that there are many others saying uh, children would never be exposed to animals or never learn to love animals. And then, of course, I would say, well, are we learning to love them in the right ways? What does that mean? Um, you know, so I think that conversation is still happening slightly varied, but it's still the same in many ways as to what was happening 100, 150 years ago. Come to the conversations about animals and science, and I think it's the same. I think medicine is one of those like final frontiers where people are like anything that's to do with health, that's the limit. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't sacrifice health for animals. And I think this is when we reach these limits. I think it starts to raise interesting questions for animal rights activists and for those who. Um, it, it becomes, I think, an easy case for people who rely on animals. You know, you'll have a conversation with people about what food they eat. And they'll say, yeah, but we have to use animals for medicine. So it becomes this mechanism to use to justify all animal use, if that makes if that makes sense, because it is such a hard, a hard conversation to have. Um, and similar to when I spoke to Sean, I do think, again, I'm, you know, I'm not hiding my colors here, but I do think that when we start to have these conversations uh, and we start them from the space of no use, we, we come up with different and interesting Examples And of course, 150 years ago or 100 years ago, um, 
there was a little space to think differently about that. But then you've got people like Thomas Harting saying, we're not 70 kilogram rats. And a lot has gone wrong in the science as well. As much of the, as much as there has been really great breakthroughs, there have also been a lot of animals and a lot of science done just to do science, not really to any sort of benefit. Um, and I think that that's happening more today than it ever was historically, because we're having this pressure to publish and this pressure to produce in a way that's not the same as it was then. Um, sorry, I just kind of vomited a whole bunch of <laughs> thoughts. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I was going. It's I think it's just to say that it's interesting because things seem to change, but they also seem to stay the same in some ways. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that we um, sort of, Outside of this book, we did a, an article for the for the New York Times about kind of animal welfare versus animal rights, though not necessarily about them the, them as opposed, but as but as sort of different ways of looking at the problems of of dealing with animals and the questions of our moral obligations. Um, and of course, there is still there is a community of animal welfare thinkers who are beginning, as you say, not from a place of no use, but from a place of, you know, insofar as animals are being used in human society, sort of how can we use fewer of them? How can we use them more humanely? Um, you know, it, which I think is, I think for people who come from the animal rights side of things can often feel like you're conceding the the whole the whole argument from the beginning, if you say, if you begin from that place, but on the other hand, as to your point, um, we're very, very far from a world in which there's, there's, there's a consensus for no use. Um, and, and especially around issues of, of health, but even in the food realm, I think that, you know, for all the progress that we made, we're, we're nowhere near, I think a, a huge consensus on that. And so mm. I think it's, it is useful I think that that there is a value in in the animal welfare perspective, you know, which I think a lot of veterinarians just inherently in their jobs like, like come at it sort of from that perspective. Um, you know, Monica as a veterinarian doesn't walk into a room even with a, 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 a and then it's a bad example because like obviously pet relationships are uh, are are. I'm not sure. What well, I, I, because there are people, there's now a, there's now a sort of no pet movement, which is, which is sort of funny. Um, you know, it's cause, cause go, cause starting from a no use place can, can take you to some very strange, um, places. Um, well, it's um, funny. And, it's funny. You said that because I was going to ask you about your final, one of your final sentences, treat thy neighbor as you treat thy pet. And maybe you could, uh, give me some of your, your thoughts around, around that phrase. Well, I think what we what we were sort of getting to there is that the level of love for our pets has become, you know, so much more familiar, family like sort of even than what it was in the period that we're writing about to the point that if you're asking if you're asking readers as we do in 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 the end of our book to sort of speak bear more of a thought for like all of the animals that exist in human society that are not their pets. And that, outside human society. Yeah. All the animals threatened by climate change and by. Yeah, uh, exactly. That, 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 that trying to think about it through the lens of your own pet is maybe useful, you know, for mm -hmm. all of the ways in which I think you can try to convince people not to eat pigs. Um, you know, you can talk about, their treatment in industrial meat production. You can talk about their intelligence through the lens of, oh, you know, some scientists taught them to play video games. But the fact that they're as smart, if not smarter than your dog is is possibly the most compelling thing that you can say about a pig, uh, except possibly to say that they're smarter than your your two-year-old or three-year-old or whatever. And, and but, but the point is that that using that frame of reference to say, okay, if you're not going to stop and think about one of these animals through the lens of like, imagine, trying to imagine what it's like to be them, like maybe it's more helpful to say, you know, you, you, you live with this dog and you would be horrified if people did X, Y, or Z to your dog. Well, imagine, imagine it being 
done to a pig. I mean, that mm -hmm. it has so many of the same capabilities and, and, and so many of the same capacities for, for emotion, for, you know, so on. I think that's sort of what, what we were getting at with love thy neighbor as thy pet. And in, in the, the sense of the neighbor being that, that, that in some ways, our solipsism, um, especially I think in this kind of digital era when it's so easy to kind of to, to, to retreat into your own curated bubble of life is that, you know, you know, the, the, a sense of care and connection for human beings in some ways feels like it's fallen lower than, than the, the attachments that we have to our animals. Um, it, it's, it's easy to, 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 it's easy to sort of like, think about the world through the lens of a very small circle of, of people and, and mm -hmm. animals who you care about and, and uh, sort of write everybody else off. Um, and it's important. Yeah. yeah it was interesting because you had had this whole conversation about systemic and how, you know, you know, you speak about the exploded circle and you talk a little bit about systemic, um, I guess, oppression to some extent, systemic, systemic use, but both of, of people and of animals and how, you know, with relationships that can become entrenched, um, whether it's informed by class relations or race relations or gender relations or species relations, we can sometimes abuse each other uh, in a variety of different ways. And um, I'd understood you as saying, you know, some pets are eating remarkably well and living lavish lives while some humans are, you know, living on the streets and homeless. And we need to recognize that these are not one and the same. But then you said, love thy neighbor as you love thy pets, kind of immediately following that. And I was like, wait, hang on a second. You were just speaking about systemic systemic differences and injustices. And what about pet keeping as being a different kind of systemic use? And that's why I brought it up as you were saying that, because you were saying it takes you to strange places. Because in some ways, pets are, well, not in some ways, in most countries and most places, pets are property. And I'm sure if I wanted Linus, if, if I wasn't content with him anymore, I could put him down like it's a it's a it's a systemic issue um so that's where my mind went but I get your point that to apply that empathy and the feelings we feel to those close to us to those who are further away to use the relationships in our orbit to think about those we can't see and directly interact with yeah I think that's the that's the spirit in which we meant it yeah I'm sorry sometimes my eye is a bit too critical and then I end up in in odd places no no and it's <laughs> like you say, I mean, I'm grappling with it myself. I have a dog. I'm, I'm definitely, I love, um, I love having pets. And I think pets are for many people, you know, the time you write about animals were everywhere we, I, in cities in, in America, our exposure to animals was a lot more pronounced. And I did my dissertation on cows partly because I have interacted with no cows in my life. Like I thought this was a fascinating thing that I, as a person who's eaten cows in my life, had never really interacted with a cow. And that's why I chose to do my dissertation on an animal that's invisible in my life, because that's really a modern phenomenon to not have these interactions with, with these kinds of animals. Um, and for many of us, the animals in our homes are a connection of sorts to, to thinking more deeply about these matters. So thank you so much for, for your thoughts and your wonderful book. Uh, it's clear that you went through a lot of work and effort, and and I know stitching together a narrative is, is really tough. So this was wonderfully done. Um, we've been speaking for an hour already, so I'm going to say, do you guys have a quote ready? Uh, and uh, and let's hear it. Yeah, um, I, I like your idea for, um, do you know where it is? I, I put a post-it okay. there. Um, you know, we, we, we dedicated our book to the nation's veterinarians. Um, and I think why we did that, well, not just because Monica is a veterinarian, but also because I think we tend to think about veterinarians as the people who, who confront this range of issues from the sort of the, the, the space of, of kind of having in a day-to-day -day way to try to improve the lot of animals without necessarily being able to pull levers to change mm -hmm. in like broad, you know, in cultural and, and economic ways, sort of how animals are used. Um, and I think that was a perspective that ultimately we came to really value as we were, as we were doing the book. You know, it's, it's easy to look back on these changes and sort of see them as things that were engineered, 
by activists and by economic forces and so on. But of course, in in the moment, I think this is true today, we are we kind of take the world that we're given and mm -hmm. we use the levers that we have to improve it in the ways that are available to us. And I think that in the lives of America's animals that like veterinarians really, you know, really play that role. Um, so Monica has a quote about veterinarians. From, and it's from Henry Ward Beecher, a famous preacher who's famous abolitionist in this country. Um, and he was speaking to, I think it was a, it was a ceremony at the vet school. I can't remember if it was a graduation. It was a graduation. Yeah. Um, so he's speaking to graduating students from veterinary school. This is an age of humanity. Men are sensitive to suffering as they never were before. Cruel laws are passing away, and even cruelty in slaughtering animals is discountenanced. Do not let any man look down on you because he ministers to mankind while you minister to suffering brutes. Let your names be remembered for your fidelity, your humanity, and your science. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I think it's it's easy to point fingers when you're not at the when you're not dealing with the day to day issues and. Um, yeah, so I mean, I didn't even ask you at the beginning. How did you become interested in becoming a vet yourself? How how was what was that journey for you? Well, like basically all of my colleagues, um, I loved animals um, from childhood very deeply, and I wanted to work with them. Um, I just, you know, it seemed. Like it was going to be amazing to spend my day with animals all day helping them, um, and I um, I had an interest and an aptitude for science, and so it did seem like a pr pretty natural fit. Although, like very many of my colleagues, I in the practice of veterinary medicine have had a lot of heartbreak and frustration, um, and you know sometimes what I want to do for animals is in conflict with sort of what uh, their owners want or, or, um, or what, uh, you know, is, is financially possible. So it's, um, it's, it's hard work. And I, I really am, am so sad for how many good veterinarians have been uh, lost to to suicide and mm -hmm. depression and um and quitting uh so i um yeah i anyway i was i was happy that we found a place in this story to to talk about them a little bit yeah i mean they are so important i was at a veterinary ethics conference and i think it's important to remember that vets don't agree either we, sometimes we have this idea of a monolithic veterinarian who has this single idea of how the practice and the profession should move forward but there's a lot of interesting debates about what your positions should be and how you should be mobilized and um, yeah i've, I've learned all this new lingo about like a veterinarian's trilemma that uh, you're, you're having to navigate these different interests, the interest of the animal, the interests of the owner, the interests of the, the profession. Um, but I was quite startled to hear how many vets do commit suicide, that it is a depression and suicide amongst vets is um, a massive, massive problem. There was an activist at the conference who was trying desperately to just make sure that this was a point on on the agenda because it is serious. And I think that as activists and people interested in animals, um, we talk about slaughterhouse workers and that we can't disavow their experiences and that we need to appreciate, I guess, the systems and structures that put them in that position in the first place and be sensitive to the fact that it's not as though they are inherently violent, awful people. Um, but same thing with, with vets, that we have to appreciate that they are in a system and a profession that's maybe not entirely of their choosing either, um, which is challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I prefer not to divide up vets between companion animal and other vets. I, I know that every single one of my classmates I went to veterinary school, no matter what kind of veterinary practice they do now, they they're, were all there because they loved animals and make a positive difference for them. Yeah, it's um, Linus is now getting water therapy. He recently had a surgery, and now I have a vet here who specializes in water therapy, which I didn't know that that was a, a thing um, that existed. But 
I'm very, very thankful that she exists and that someone was here to help Linus when he was in when he was in pain. Um, so thank you for for the work you do, and thank you for the work you both do with writing. Last question: How did you two come to figure out that you could write together without killing each other? <laughs> you know, we we um, we did the the first book sort of on a lark. Uh, we were surprised that nobody had ever done a popular book about a sort of book for a general audience about the history of rabies. Um, and there was so much fun stuff to write about. And that one, we kind of divided up more along the lines of our kind of professional expertise. Monica handled the science and that stuff more. And I handled more of the cultural things. But one of the great things about this book was that having done it once, I think we felt more confident to branch out a bit more and that, and, you know, we, we, you did more of the vet stuff in this book, but I did some of the medical research stuff and um, you did the PT Barnum stuff more. And, and we, we kind of, um, and then we edit each other's chapters and add mm -hmm. often add little, little bits to them um, to try to make it kind of feel like a coherent whole. Um, so, you know, we enjoy working together on, on our writing with it's um, it's, it's really wonderful to have a shared mission. So it's, it's, it's been very good and I think we'll keep doing it. <laughs> Fantastic. I know that uh, you've got another book that's recently come out as well on viral viral matters, but not really. Oh, no, viral. sorry. That was, I wrote a book w many years ago, back in 2006, about internet culture. Um, oh, this is an older book. Okay. Was, yeah, much older book. Yeah. Um, so no, we, this is only the second book that we have done together. I see. I see. And and you, Bill, you're trained as a, as a, as a writer and as a journalist? <laughs> Trained is a strong word, but um, yes, I've, <laughs> I, um, I've, I've been a magazine editor for, for my career and, um, and now work at the New York Times and, um, and have written some as, as part of my role as an editor, but mostly have been an editor um, throughout that, that time period. So, um, so and yeah, was your interest in animals sparked by Monica's interest in veterinary yeah, practice? Yeah, I never, or? never would have. I mean, I've, I've always loved animals, um, but I've, I'd never imagined that I would write about animals until we got into this. But the the more I've gotten into it, the more I've I've found it just a fascinating subject, and there's just so many, uh, so many different dimensions of it, and it's a subject that you realize that people people have strong feelings about that they also have like never really interrogated their their thinking about it. And I certainly would put myself in that category. Um, and I think it's difficult too, because I think fundamentally people's sense about like how to feel about animals and not just their suffering, but about our obligations to them are just very, very unsettled. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think, I think even, even activists sometimes struggle, I think, to have a fully coherent kind of, set of attitudes and practices around that issue because so many things that we do in our lives uh, uh, implicate the treatment of animals and it can be very difficult i think to to think holistically about that so i just yeah. think basically i think it's a great subject not just because it, it's fun to tell animal stories but also because i think that as purely as kind of a moral issue there's so many complexities. It's an awesome subject and I'm really happy that you guys are writing this material and it's been a delight to talk with you today. Thank you as well. Thank you to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. This episode was edited by myself. The logo was done by Jeremy John and the bed music by Gordon Clark. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hockenfelder. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah.